I bring to you grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said in the introduction, this is a perfect opportunity for us to stop and reflect on what it means for us to, to be the church. It's so easy for us to look busy as a church, isn't it? I mean, you just pick up any church bulletin and you can see all sorts of activities that happen in a, a given week at the church complex. So there's prayer groups, there's Bible studies, there's men's shed and women's guild, youth groups. I mean, there's kids' church. You might have a mainly music. There's sorts of arts and crafts, music rehearsals. And then there's church council and committees and subcommittees and task groups that report to subcommittees who report to committees. Gotta love Lutherans, don't you? So, yep, we're very busy little beavers. God must be impressed. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with all of these different activities. I mean, who am I to criticise a, a prayer group, for example? But as we're conducting these different activities, are we mindful of how they tie in with the mission of God for his church? Because we do need to be mindful of that, don't we? Many of these activities have had to cease as a result of COVID-19 and all the restrictions in place. Now, when things return to normal, whatever that normal is going to look like, the things that we stop doing might be just as important as the things that we start to do once again. So I'd like you to spend a moment now reflecting on what activities in the church haven't you missed? And so the ones that you're not looking forward to resuming once things get back to normal. And what things do you think should be a priority? So what activities should be a priority as we return to situation normal? So just spend a moment reflecting on that. I wonder how you went. I bet you there's some smart people out there that thought, you know, I'm not going to miss, you know, coming back to the church cleaning roster. I'm sorry, that's a non-negotiable. But what priorities did you come up with? And I wonder whether your priorities match with the priorities of God for his church. Again, it's pretty important that our priorities align, I would have thought. And if you're wondering what God's priorities might be, then you actually don't need to look too much further than the reading that we had just a little bit earlier from Matthew chapter 9 and chapter 10. The good thing about this week's reading is that we got to hear a, a very good portion of it. I mean, usually the way that the, the lectionary works in the church calendar is that you get a snippet of a gospel reading and another verse from the Bible. But often we, we kind of hear it as a standalone and don't get its context. The beauty of this reading that we heard from Matthew is that we do get the context. It's a bit different in that we get the whole sequence of events as we're drawn into the mission of God as seen through the eyes of his son. Now, the abbreviated version of this mission and this sequence is as follows. Jesus, he's carrying out the mission of God and he's struck by the enormity of the task. He has compassion on the crowds that he's ministering to and he shares with his disciples how big the task is. You know, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. And then what he does is he actually calls his disciples to be involved, to engage in the mission, and he sends them out into the mission field. So that's the abbreviated version. Now, if you feel as though you got that covered, you're very on top of what the mission of God is and your place in it and how you're to do it, then you might want to stop this recording right now and go off and do it. Um, so feel free, go your hardest. I'm guessing most of you are going to stay with me a bit longer because you might be wondering, so what exactly is the mission of God and what is my place in it and how am I resourced to carry it out? So if that is you, 
then stay with me a bit longer. And perhaps, you know, you can pause me just for a moment and go off and get your Bibles and bring them back and we'll work through it together. So I'll give you a moment to get yours and I've got mine here as well. So open it up to, to Matthew chapter 9, um, reading from verse 35. And you'll notice that it starts with Jesus out and about, and he's in the towns and the villages. And what is it that he's doing? Well, he's teaching, he's preaching, and he's healing, which is not surprising because that's basically part of his job description. His role as God's chosen one, the sent one from God. Elsewhere, he's called the Messiah. You see, Christ is not the surname of Jesus. It's really his job title. So it's really Jesus the Christ, just as like I'm Stephen the pastor, and you've got Bob the builder, that type of thing. So the key performance indicators, the KPIs of this role of Christ are as follows. The Christ is going to teach and preach and heal. And there's this other minor thing that he needs to do, which is save all of humanity. So needless to say, there weren't too many applicants for the position of Messiah. But it's not just a job for Jesus, is it? I mean, it's not the kind of occupation where he clocks off at the end of the day and puts his feet up. He is fully invested in what he's doing. You can see that. He's fully invested in the people that he's doing it for. Now, these days, a job counsellor might advise Jesus that he needs to, to set some boundaries between his professional and personal life. You know, he needs to be able to separate work from leisure. But as Jesus engages in this messianic role, as he mixes among those he's called to serve and to save, he is filled with compassion for them. Every fibre of his being is invested in each person that he encounters because he sees just how harassed and helpless they are in all sorts of different ways. And I imagine that would have varied from person to person as to what they were harassed and helpless about. And as a result of seeing the enormity of this need of humanity, Jesus shares it with his disciples. He shares the problem as he sees it. He basically is saying, fellas, can you see that this harvest, it's, it's plentiful. I reckon he's really saying it's overwhelming, isn't it? So the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I don't reckon a lot's changed in 2000 years about that problem. The harvest is still plentiful, isn't it? In fact, it's growing greater each and every day, bigger today than what it was yesterday. And what about the workers? Do we still have a problem of there being few workers to send out into the harvest field? I mean, globally, the numbers of Christians are rising each and every day. Proportionally, not necessarily. So in our country, in Australia, uh, there's certainly, you know, still uh, different people are becoming Christians each and every day. But as a proportion of the population, it's on the decline and has been for a number of decades. But is it as simple as taking the number of people who identify as Christian and equating that with how many workers are in the harvest field? So does everyone who say, I'm a Christian, do they consider that they're a worker in the harvest. I'm not convinced. But what do you think? I mean, how many people in your congregation here at Aberfall Park, or if you're connected with another congregation, how many people in your congregation do you think consider themselves to be a worker in the harvest field? Now, that's pretty hard to judge, I know, and I'm not necessarily wanting you to judge your brothers and sisters in Christ. So, so maybe the better question to ask is, do you consider yourself to be a worker in God's harvest?
So spend a moment thinking about that. And look, I don't want just a yes or no answer. That's letting you off the hook a bit easy. What I want you to consider is your reasons for giving your answer. So if it's yes, I believe I'm a worker, then think about what does that mean? What does that look like? And if your answer is no, well, explain. Why is that? So spend a moment reflecting on that. I wonder how you got on. It's a pity I can't have that conversation with you, but hopefully you've had that conversation with those that you might be watching this with, um, or perhaps at a later time you can have that conversation. So to recap things to this point, Jesus, he's out and about enacting his messianic role. He's teaching, preaching, and healing. He has compassion on those he's ministering to, and he shares the enormity of the task with his disciples. And it's a problem because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. However, did you notice, have you ever noticed with this very familiar text that straight away Jesus provides the answer, the solution? Yeah, the harvest is plentiful. Yes, the workers are few. So ask. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers into his harvest field. I'm not convinced we ask enough. You see, the problem is not so much the quantity of the harvest. The problem is the quantity of those who consider themselves workers who are gathering in the harvest. So Jesus tells us to ask him, as the Lord of the harvest, to send workers. And again, did you notice how the disciples aren't even given a chance to actually ask? So Jesus presents them with the issue, presents them with the need to ask. And before they even get a chance to ask, he's actually already answered on their behalf. He calls them, calls them to himself and he commissions them, if you like, and then sends them out into the harvest field. And this is actually where we enter into the sequence of events in God's mission plan. As disciples, I'm considering that you are a disciple. Don't know for sure, but if you consider yourself to be a disciple, then you are involved in God's mission sequence. Because as disciples, we've actually traveled with Jesus, haven't we, through the course of our lives. For some of us, that might be for only a portion of our lives. If we've come to faith later in life, or we might have started out on the faith journey, gone away and come back to it, a bit like the prodigal son or daughter. But for some of us, we might have been in the church our entire lives, and that's my case. So I was baptised as an infant, brought up in the church, and never walked away from the church. So as a result, we have travelled the journey with Jesus. We've been on the receiving end of the ministry of Jesus the Messiah in our lives, his teaching, his preaching, and his healing ministry amongst us. And we've encountered that through his word. We've encountered that through the waters of baptism. We've encountered that as we've gathered around his table to share in the Lord's Supper, something that many of us are missing greatly at this point in time. So as we've encountered Jesus in these ways, we've actually grown to understand his heart for the world, haven't we? We've grown to understand the compassion that he has for all people, for the hurt, the broken, the lost, the lonely. And we've also grown to understand that the, the harvest, the task, is enormous. It's plentiful. And also, we've probably recognised that the workers are few. And so by the time we get to the point of thinking, oh, maybe we need to ask for some more workers to be sent into the harvest field, it might have dawned on us, hopefully it's dawned on us, that Jesus might be answering that 
prayer on our behalf. We're called to get involved because we are involved. How can we not be? Because we're actually products of this harvest. If we're disciples of Jesus, then we're part of the harvest that's already been gathered. And the sequence of events that's led up to our inclusion in God's kingdom doesn't now come to a grinding halt in us, does it? Shouldn't. We don't just come to church and think that that's the end game. Great, we're here, that's fine, you know, full stop. No, we're called to be the church. And we're also sent to be the church out in the harvest field. But you know, I, I reckon you already know that. I reckon every Christian really already knows that deep down, and maybe not so deep down. We know that we're an answer to that prayer. Here I am, Lord, send me. And that sometimes fills us with a bit of guilt because we recognise that maybe we haven't been very good workers in the harvest field and maybe it freaks us out a little bit. We think, well, hang on a minute, I'm not fully equipped for this task. I don't have the, the courage like some of those first disciples had. I, I'm not qualified. I, I don't have the knowledge, the ability and... Oh, we can come up with lots of excuses, you and I. And you see, that's what I love about this Matthew reading. Jesus didn't send out his disciples with a whole stack of resources and expertise. You see, one of the mistakes I think we've made as a church in, over the years is that we've tried to do our mission from a position of strength. You know, we think if, if only we can have enough numbers, you know, a certain critical mass, or, or if we have good facilities, you know, nice comfy pews, and, and, and if we can have all sorts of exciting programs, and if we can nail that music, oh, then we're going to be effective when it comes to God's mission. But look at how Jesus sends his disciples out. Listen. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff. They engaged in this mission from a position of vulnerability, not a position of strength. And I kind of like that. You see, it gives me great comfort to know that it's God's grace that's going to be enough for us as we engage in this mission. That his power is actually going to be made evident in our weakness, not in our strength. And so when we consider ourselves to be weak when it comes to this mission, when we go, I don't know how to do it, I, I, I don't know the words, then we're actually going to be depending on God's strength. And that's a good place to be in. You see, we're called and we're sent at the invitation of our Lord and in the authority of our Lord. What else do we need? Jesus is the Lord of the harvest and it is his harvest field. So as we go into the harvest field ourselves, we actually go with Jesus, knowing that he is fully invested in the success of this mission venture. So it's his peace that we're bringing to bear. It's his compassion that we're sharing with the people that we encounter in our lives. People that are harassed and helpless in so many ways, knowing that we ourselves have been in those places plenty of times and maybe are in them right now. So may you continue the sequence of the mission of God as you encounter those in your lives. May the Holy Spirit empower you to be the church, to be the presence of God in his harvest field. Amen. And as you do this, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep guard over your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now we're going to sing our next song together. So blessings to you as we do this.